So this video is very different to ones we've done at CryptoSlide before, but something that I've got a lot of experience in in my career before as a journalist. I was a filmmaker. The first uh, job I had was actually a uh, camera operator, and then I moved into film directing, uh, made a few feature films, uh, actually ran my own production company before I moved into the world of Web3. So I got invited over to Slovakia by the core blockchain team to go and see their technology, see their setup, and see what they're doing. Partly due to, I interviewed uh, Oki, their CEO, um, and I was really impressed with all the things he was saying. But I think he could tell I was slightly reticent to almost b believe that they were actually able to produce all of the dApps that they were say that they were, and the technology was working as it as it did. Because to me, it's the, the the closest application that I can think of is actually the app from Silicon Valley, um, which was with, without the high-end compression if you remove the compression element and just look at all the other features they were looking to do like a fully decentralized internet uh, with the peer-to-peer -peer communications uh, they obviously had their own token that a lot of it was run by so it was decentralized in that way and ran um, through the token um, and it really excited me so they invited me to go over to Slovakia to see um, the, meet the team and, and see the production so I did and this video is a little mini documentary of me and my time over a weekend in Slovakia meeting Oki and Michael and, and Mate and Ratislav and the, the whole team. Um, I won't spoil the video, but I was absolutely blown away by the reception and I would just like to say like, thank you for, it was such a warm welcome, such a great experience. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited for you to, to, to see what went on. Oh yeah, we spoke. Yeah. Hey, we spoke briefly. This is uh, Hello. Mike. Hello. He's Hi, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's like our cameraman. Uh -huh. He's uh, one of our 3D artists. Oh, cool. And stuff like this. So. Awesome. You might have, I'll grab one of your bags. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. You sure? No, I'm I can good. take okay, one Okay, take the heavy one. <laughs> I'll take the heavy one. So how's the flight? Everything good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dead easy. Yeah. Um, no Wi-Fi, so... Hopefully the work that I've done won't get lost. I'm trying to work offline on Google Maps. <laughs> British. <laughs> so, uh, but, um, this is amazing. Thank you so much for coming out there. I wonder why I'm getting it. Oh, oh, it's, come on. It's, uh, it's the least we could do. I, uh, you a Oh, wow, look at I, I feel like a VIP. <laughs> this is incredible. normal battery pack. Yeah, yeah. You can charge a laptop mm -hmm. uh, once, but I can run this device for three days with no charge on it. Phone's down there. Let's start this up. It's going to start up. It's touch screen. Mm -hmm. Because we're running uh, Android on it, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I have to just switch on the hotspot. Otherwise, it doesn't, it won't stream out. But normally, mm -hmm. with uh, Linux, it just goes. Mm -hmm. Just to show you, we'll start the miner, and what we'll do is, is log in. Whilst we're doing this, we will. So is this like a little Raspberry Pi or something inside it? Or? Well, it's not a Raspberry Pi per se. It, it's something similar. Mm -hmm. um, and the hotspot is active. And you can now go and check for Wi-Fi and you'll see there's, a, there's Luna. And you'll see that it will also be Slovak. 
because we Leave are connected through, yeah, and you connect to that. But no, I think it's, um, I think it's very, very cool. I mean, come on! Yeah, I'm on the road! <laughs> <laughs> Adventure! So, welcome to the experience of Bratislava. <laughs> no, this is still on Austria, I don't know if you... The village. Liam's probably gonna phone his wife, he's gonna be like... Sweetie, you have no idea, these guys are crazy. They took me next to the highway on a gravel road. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't know if I'm gonna survive my, this. My, my wife would be like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> well, I'll go home and I'll tell, I'll tell my mom, I'll be like, mom, so like, I arrived in uh, in Austria and got into this like black, blacked out Range Rover. <laughs> and, went, and then drove into like these random dark fields where a tractor almost came <laughs> She's like, Liam, what did you do? <laughs> it's alright, mom, it's crypto, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's crypto, it's fine. It's, it's standard. Uh -huh. yeah. cool. This is a, a market. Oh fuck. <laughs> this is this is like the mo this uh, this movie, which is the basic day in the Bitcoin market. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not gonna lie, this road's actually pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> it's not that bad. Thank goodness we decided to go this way because if we were in a, on the highway, we would have still been stuck. We would be stuck in for one hour. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this is it, isn't it? Now it looks like. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, which way? Lorry. Left, 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 left. Now. I think a lorry did misread the height of the bridge. Yeah, uh -huh. by the looks of it. It's telephones, it's, it's devices like this. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, you know, I, I've got normal computers that I'm mining What's on my laptop. What's the most optimal setup to, to get the best performance from the mining? Well, there's... Look, the um, it depends on on the amount of power consumption and things that you have. How are you? Nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Yeah. No, thanks for having me. Yes. You're absolutely welcome. How are you, Matthias? How's it going, guys? What happened to Oki? Oh, he's just parking. He's parking the car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Thank you. The project in Swiss, right? Or what is this exchange? Yeah, yeah, Swiss Park, yeah. Swiss Park. Yeah. 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 Uh, told me about it. Is that the friend with the owner? Yeah, yeah, I'm friends with Alex, yeah. Um, Alex met him. Fazel. Yeah, amazing, amazing guy. Him and his brother. They've got yeah. such a great ethos as well for the business. Like, I think that's the reason why they've been able to make it through too bad. Euro. Casting there, yeah. uh, nice banner. We got a printed specifically for you today. Oh wow! Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, so, so I, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not joining you. No worries, but I'll see you tomorrow, right? Yeah, see you yeah. tomorrow. Thanks, okay. Okay. Cheers, dude. Thanks, Thanks. 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 But we are going to do it, right? Now, or with Mike? Not there. No, I'm going to Vienna. Ciao, yeah, Mike. Uh, a really lovely dinner. Uh, Bratislav, the CTO, came and joined us um, and we just had a really nice time getting to know each other. Um, I asked some questions about the project uh, while we were out, but ultimately it was just about me trying to gauge the the, the characters. Um, and from, from my point of view, I really got on with them. Um, Oki's a little bit like me. He's, um, it, it, he's a little introverted. Um, 
but is able to be like professionally extroverted, um, which is something that I've kind of ha- had to deal with in my, in my career. Um, and yeah, just really lovely people. Like honestly, from my point of view, um, they just seem like really nice people and really intelligent people. And throughout the whole weekend, I really tried to push and question them around the value proposition, the use case, the user experience of what they were building. And there was very little, if anything, that I could find where I felt there was room for improvement, in all honesty, other than the fact that it's a huge project with lots of moving parts. And my only concern for them is, one, how you can actually market that to people, because it's it's a network that does so much that you can't say, oh, we're, ch- we're, we're changing the world through blockchain, like how many projects have said that? Um, and then also just trying to keep all the moving parts together. But they've got a huge team, um, decentralized all around the world, several hundred people. So that sounds like the size of a team that could deal with that sort of a thing. And as I say, like user experience, um, onboarding, um, the decentralized nature of the whole project, all these things that I tried to find where the weak points could be. I was really struggling to find them. The weak points I did find was... Um, in all honesty, fair enough in my point of view, in the as we're going to go into next and the next day, there were some elements of the technology that was not quite there yet, but only in terms of, one, it was a weekend, so not everyone in the company was working, so I was very blessed that people were there at all, and I was able to speak to developers and reach out to developers when there were any sort of little uh, bugs within it, but... Nothing that would be a red flag for me in terms of something that I wouldn't expect and something that's still in a closed beta, not fully released yet in terms of the dApps. Um, So yeah, we're going to move on now into the second day where I start to have a play with some of the technology, get my hands on CorePass, um, the Ting meeting platform. And yeah, it was lovely, lovely first day and a great, uh, great night out. first thing I tried was core pass and I'd left my passport in the hotel room stupidly but I did have my UK driving license with me this should have been fine we scanned it and it failed initially I thought here we go like something's gonna be up here nope turns out my driving license had expired two days before and the KYC within the core pass app had therefore failed because it wasn't a valid ID we failed correctly in this situation um, so we, we had to take a pause and go back to the hotel to get my passport we then tried my passport and that worked absolutely fine interestingly um, I did have a picture of my passport and we tried a few different things so we tried taking uh, just uploading the photo that I'd taken my passport about two months prior to see whether that worked that didn't work it, it wouldn't accept it um, we then tried taking a photo of my the picture from another phone to see whether that would work. And again, we couldn't fake um, the KYC. It needed to be a photo that had been taken at that moment within the app. Even though it did allow you to upload a photo if you used Android, it still had to be a photo taken straight away. So um, I even tried doing a screenshot to see, okay, well, let's make a new image. Let's take a screenshot of a photo, therefore the file has been created recently, see if that works. Nope, still didn't work. So I was actually really impressed with how that managed. So the fact that I left my passport in the hotel actually worked out really well for me being able to test um, whether the KYC worked properly. So that was really, really fascinating.
can you trade with him a bit? Uh, oh. He wants to sell his Litecoin. <laughs> but keep the base. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you can play around with it so long okay. if you like. Can you have a look at it? Do what you want. And then Rassi Stuff said he will come and I will take this and put it on this side. Rassi Stuff said he will come and explain to you nice technical things that you would like to know about. Do in the bottom, in the you bottom. scroll down. Okay, yeah. Oh yeah, where it would be on the other exchanges. Cool. Let, let's make it a little bit fairer. I'll check if some of the guys are online. So after we went through the ping exchange, we then had a look at the Ting meeting platform, which is really cool. Um, and it's probably one of the pieces of technology that's probably the furthest along. Um, obviously with the ping exchange, it's hard to really test it when there's a lack of liquidity. I was just trading with other developers. They funded uh, essentially like a paper wallet so that I could trade and create order um, orders and see the order book moving and such and um, I mean it seemed to work work quite well as, as an exchange and I was privy to some of the, the background architecture to how it's made up um, and that did really impress me and it looked like a system that could very much solve uh, a lot of the problems especially after the whole FDX debacle um, commingling of funds etc um, Ping clearly has systems in place to allow for um, increase liquidity across the ecosystem uh, while also securing funds in, in cold storage uh, and limiting the, the need for sort of hot wallets, which I think is uh, re a really interesting uh, focus. Um, so the, the, the Ting meeting platform is really cool though, obviously it's all peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, there's uh, a user interface that's just in browser. You log in with your core pass and you can uh, essentially, it's kind of like as if Google Meet was also m mixed with say something like StreamYard. So you've got this interface where, you, uh, and also like OBS as well. So you can, like OBS, you can organize your scenes, put your assets in there, decide who's gonna be where in the scene and whatnot, create multiple scenes. Uh, and the UI is very similar to sort of OBS. Uh, you can just use it as a meeting platform. As uh, Oki said, there's ways to sort of take notes. Uh, there's ways to run polls internally. But then you can also stream that meeting um, out. So I can see definite use cases for things like um, developer um, sort of conversations. Obviously the, the Ethereum developers all get together on a call and that gets streamed. You can essentially use the same platform to bring people in and also stream it out live uh, and create kind of other areas where you can have private conversations. So um, as a peer-to-peer -peer, um, video platform and also a platform for content creators, uh, given the way that the, the content is kind of locked into the blockchain and kind of secured against people sort of illegally downloading it. Um, I think there's a lot of innovations uh, w within uh, the Ting platform, which I'm excited to see. But like a lot of the other technology, they're not fully developed yet. They're way beyond kind of concept stage. Um, things are working. I was able to see it working on chain. Um, really excited for, for where it goes in future, really, and seeing some more about it. talk about decentralization one of the things that people are always looking at with new projects is who are the stakeholders who are involved who who look to profit from this how is the project being funded and given that you work on a proof of work system was there any uh, private either private sale or pre-mine before everything went live so first part of the question to answer um... There are three partners, which is Rastislav um, Vashitska, uh, my father, Michael Lopesher, and myself, Orkut Lopesher. Uh, we primarily funded this entire business by our own means. Um, and we did have a token sale, uh, which was the core token sale. There was a pre-sale for this. 
um, which we actually did over many years. Um, however, we did not really uh, advertise it and try and, you know, create a big marketing campaign around the uh, sale of the token itself. Um, we are sold out. Uh, most of these funds are actually um, implemented for the liquidity of the exchange that we're going to be releasing. Um, and then at the same time, um, we as the three individuals uh, do make certain decisions, but we, uh, out of a blockchain perspective, we don't have any say. We might be the founders of it and we might be the maintainers and, and developers of it, but we have a general consensus already there. We have a foundation which is uh, managing uh, the consensus of, of the blockchain itself. Um, and we have a community which is also, you know, participating actively uh, within the mining and these types of things. Um, of course, there is profit uh, in the company itself, but the primary vision is um, to distribute the network as much as possible and to bring in a new form of, um, I would say, distribution of wealth where everyone can participate and have an opportunity to, to utilize the network for their own benefit and be able to expand the network and build more applications and, and their businesses around it. Um, on top of this, what I can say is we, given my history and my father's history and Rastislav's history, we always tend to say that we are as strong as our team and as strong as our community and people that believe in the project and that want to adapt the technology. And of course, their opinions matter to us. And we always take that into account of what is the general consensus. Um, we currently utilize our own community to understand and analyze the community's um, way of thinking so that we can apply that into the technology that we can provide exactly what is being requested. Um, out of a core pass perspective, we take the approach that we do not want to hold your data. We do not want to be in charge of your data. We want to give you the opportunity to be in control yourselves. This is the same with the Ting and the Meeting platform. This is the same with the exchange. This is the same with, um, with the, the payment gateway that we've built, which is core pay. Um, of course, there are small fees. Uh, that are involved, which we do take, um, but that is so that we can remain a going concern and, and continue on developing the technology to take it to the next level, to the next versions, implement the new solutions that is required in the market for the adaptability of it. Um, and at the end of the day, I can say for me, the greatest satisfaction, and I think I can speak for both my partners, is to see how the technology is being adapted and utilized and how people are coming together to bring it into a new environment, into a new era, that we can actually do things differently and we can rely on each other um, rather than being dictated of what to be done. What group of people do you feel are going to benefit most from the applications that you're developing on the core blockchain? Well, first and foremost, to answer that question, one has to look at adoption. And adoption doesn't always come from the top. It actually comes from the bottom. If you take a simple example, two-factor authentication uh, that started off, which is Google Authenticator or uh, Twilio or, you know, all these various two-factor uh, platforms, um, it was actually adopted by the public that stipulated that this would help them to secure their accounts and the push came from the bottom. So in the, in, in the whole essence of the entire environment, I would say the general public is going to benefit from it, but also the entities itself, because they can actually, the, just if we take core pass as a particular instance, um, the entities have 
knowledge of who their customers are. They have access to the real time data. They know that it's not falsified. They can um, be in an environment where they can uh, apply to all the regulation that's coming in. If you have, you know, you have GDPR compliance, you have CCPA, CPA, you have all the various different compliances that you always need to make sure that you comply with and that you, uh, out of a regulatory perspective, whether you're a financial institution or whether you are just a plain website or whether you are selling a product, you would actually be able to uh, benefit in this factor that you know that your platform can become even more secure when you integrate this. And um, at the end of the day, it would uh, bring a, a, a much better user experience also for the platforms of onboarding because even though you even though the, the core pass is a difficult platform to onboard it is only once that you need to do it everything from there on is a simple scan of a qr code no more need to fill out forms no more need to um, uh, remember a username or a password also these types of um, integrations which we do into or, or that we have for websites will uh, bring down certain parts of the development that they need to do if they integrate this from, from the get-go. And they don't need to have additional pages, need to have additional um, types of um, securities for their forms to uh, prevent from uh, people hacking into the forms itself that's being filled out and phishing and these types of things, because this is on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. And I think, in essence, I think everyone will actually benefit from it. Um, who applies it and who adapts it. What's, what's it like working with your father? <laughs> you know, I'm exceptionally lucky because my father is an amazing man. And the one thing that I can say is since birth I've had a very special relationship with him. Um, he's, he's been my mentor my whole life and he taught me one of the things that I can say to this day I am thankful for is that nothing comes for free and you, you must always take responsibility for your own actions. Um, I was always given the opportunity if I wanted something that he would help me. However, he made me work for it in a way that I had to come up with either half of the money or um, I had to prove uh, of what is the need for it if I did not have half of the money, but what could I give in return. And he taught me valuable lessons in these things. Um, he also exposed me to so many different cultures, which allowed me to travel around the world with him since a young age, since the age of four. I've been traveling all over the world where he's had business and been exposed to different cultures, different people, um, understanding how things work in, in different environments. Um, He's been a visionary in so many different things, um, even you know when he put us back into South Africa and we uh, worked in rural environments, building the closed loop banking system was just phenomenal. Um, you know, he, the exposure that he's given me to technology, the opportunities that he's always uh, presented, it, it has brought me so much the wiser at a much younger age to be able to assess and read and understand um, uh, situations or people or or organizations and i can say also the thing that i love about working with my father is is my father is not just my father and my mentor he's also my best friend he, we can fight like cats and dogs. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Nothing. <laughs> it's it's not just a walk in the park, and it's not just a yes, daddy, and a yes, my son type of situation. We have heated discussions on opinions, and um, this is where I say I think I'm extremely lucky in this aspect that I can get to spend so much time with him and learn so much from him. And I think in this way he he. 
he's done things for me which I would say I don't think many people have uh, had that experience and um, I'm I'm very honored to be working with him and uh, he's uh, he's an amazing guy amazing character um, difficult though <laughs> You've been, you talk about, um, I think the whole team's talked about this, this word, this word being transparency a, a lot. Um, why is that so important to you? Transparency is actually the essence of trust. I would rather be truthful and honest than what I would try and cover something up. I would rather be transparent and stipulate what we could do than to say, oh, we can do it, but, you know, not tell you exactly how it's done. Um, many people can say in the beginning of the project, we were a little bit closed with the information. We didn't provide enough information, but there was a very specific reason to it. It was because of everything that we were developing we we had several difficult situations that where we were transparent some people tried to take the idea or do certain things only when we came to the right timing where we knew okay now's the time that we can fully be transparent everything actually became so much better um because people started understanding and started seeing that we're not there to try and hide something. We're not there to, um, to give you a false pretense. If, if we can't do it, we can, we can now say, well, this is the reason why we can't do it, or we'll have a look into it and be able to try and have a look if we can do it. But out of an essence of transparency, um, for us, we want to be a, a form of trust like the blockchain. If you have a look, when, when, when you look at blockchain technology, there is the singular form of trust, which is the immutable ledger that's distributed and that's decentralized. And they trust that. You have a look at Bitcoin, you cannot argue that a transaction has taken place because if you have the hash, it's taken place and you know the peers that this transaction has taken place in. This allows people to say, okay, well, I can trust in such technology. And given that um, the current crypto market where people have falsely stipulated what they're doing and not being transparent about it blows up much worse. My favorite saying is the truth will always come out regardless of whether it's now or later, but it will come out. And if you were always transparent and honest and truthful about it, then everyone knows immediately. It's not something that you need to hide or pretend. Transparency is the most important thing, I would say, in, 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 uh, in, in, the, in the human aspect of being able to relate to one another, to be, um, to be able to cooperate with each other. Because if you don't have transparency, you know, I, I trust you, for example, because I feel that you're transparent and open and truthful and honest with me. And I can relate with you. Even if we have a difference of opinion, at least I know that I can trust. You look at your sources. If you're a journalist, if you are uh, in the financial institution or whatever, transparency is actually extremely important and is the essence of, of the basis of trust. And for us, I don't want to, to have to lie. I, I, I cannot lie, firstly, and I will tell you why. Because it becomes, for me, I, I go red in the face and I don't know how to, <laughs> to react or how to do things. And the worst part is, is if you told a lie, you have to remember the lie. So this is the problem. Um, I did say one little lie, which was... Um, uh, the other night when we went out and I was 38, but I, it was really, it was really because I didn't, I couldn't remember how old I was. <laughs> but, but these are the things, you know, that, that I could say, I, I think that transparency is the basis um, that will improve life itself. 
Um, it would resolve a lot of conflict. It can resolve um, problems, issues. Um, you know, if there is transparency and someone brings up an argument, you can always relate to it and you can stipulate here it was fully transparent. And that's, a, that, that's the fact of life. One of the things I find really interesting with the project is a lot of crypto over the last 18 months especially and also during the, the bull run through 2017 was built around speculation on price rather than real world use cases. It was about, well, it was about speculation on price and speculation around technology. With Core, you're, you've obviously launched the blockchain already, but you're now launching decentralized applications that directly solve real world use cases. With that comes the relationship between your coins and tokens and the utility of those applications. Therefore, do you feel that price speculation will be as relevant to the core blockchain as it is to the current crypto market with one in interesting point being if the price of the token was to go through the roof does that then make the utility less access accessible to people interesting question um price speculation is already happening in the in our community <laughs> And there's many people doing very interesting mathem mathematics behind it. Now, when you look at crypto itself, um, at Bitcoin, at Ethereum, at Litecoin, at you know Solano, or the, all the various different cryptos that you have out there, I would say it is a human nature that you always want to look into what would be the profitability. Well, it's it is definitely now human nature. It didn't used to be in the in, in the earlier days, but now it is for sure. Speculation is always one of the things that that everyone um, hypes on to actually stipulate why the project is better. Um, I go back to the first answer that I gave, which is we built a blockchain not for the coin but for the network and the immutable ledger. Given um, the use case that you bring out of it, it is actually very unique in this way because there's never been a blockchain that's been released with a real use case. That is, well, I mean like a real use case, meaning like a, a full utility use case um, that is only reliant on those, those currencies or let's say digital assets that we assets but um, when you have a look at the token itself and when you have a look at the coin itself you need both in core coins um, the core coin you need to actually hash into the blockchain itself so that you can hash the transaction and do these kinds of things because that's the native currency of the core blockchain itself the token is a utility token which is a means of service or a means of exchange for a service and even if the price of the, well, everyone was speculating that core token is going to go uh, through the roof and that also the coin is going to go through the roof. Of course, given that the application is so heavy intensive on utilizing these uh, digital assets, I do think that there will be quite a heavy demand on it. And with a limited supply, specifically in the coin itself, it, the maths is quite easy, um, 18 to 22 and a half million coins per year. Uh, currently, we will only have half a year this year um, of the coins being mined. So that means like you're looking at something like 9.8 to, to 10 million coins, which are available with the release of the core pass itself. If just all of our community members that we have adapt this, this already puts a huge demand on the coin itself, um, which of course I think would have quite a, a, a price spike. Um, if you take it out of the perspective of supply and demand. When you have a look at the core token, there's 1 billion core tokens which are available. Now, given that the core token is a utility token that is utilized in services and in smart contracts and is a, a means of exchange for, for the value of the data and things like this, 
Um, I do think that there will also be, there, there might be in the beginning a dump because some people have already made a 20x on it and that was not done through us. That was actually through other use cases that bought the token and saw the value in it and um, bumped up the price itself for their selling price. Um, it was very uh, accepted into the market itself on these token sales, which meant that the people started seeing the value to the token itself. So out of a perspective, I think there is a lot of people, people are throwing out really crazy numbers. Some are saying that we are this, having the same type of supply and the same type of uh, topology as, as Ethereum. They said that we're probably going to end up in the Ethereum bracket. Now, you do have to understand that, you know, this took Ethereum several years to get to where they are today. So I don't think this will happen instantaneously. You're not going to become a billionaire overnight. But I do think that the, the coin and the token itself holds its own value and respective to the adoption that's taking place with the applications that we're bringing in, that's got a true means of utilization and um, a true value um, aspect to the coin itself and the token, I do think that um, it will increase in price and it will have a stable increase because of the way that you can utilize it. Um, and I think people are for sure going to speculate because they're already doing that. So one of the parts of the question was around um, whether the price increase makes the services available. So like I've been playing around with Core Pass, uh -huh. um, and you obviously pay in Core Token or in um, Fiat for that. Um, there's obviously a version of the world where you don't value things in Fiat anymore anyway. You value it based on how much can be mined from your device. So with your blockchain, um, even if the price goes up massively in terms of fiat, you can still mine it on your phone um, and you could mine some on your phone over a few days to allow you to then make the transaction you're looking for. Mm -hmm. But in today's world, we are still always at the moment going to be, you may value it against Bitcoin. That is something that people do. And I something that I personally recommend when people are looking at the price of crypto. crypto. Um, but yeah, for the most part, we value uh, crypto and digital assets in terms of fiat. How, given that your the applications like Core Pass and Ting, etc., these are all like your applications on the blockchain. This isn't the blockchain itself. The blockchain is doing its own thing. Mm -hmm. How do you imagine managing that price to to keep it affordable if the price of the token goes up? Well. Um... You know, right now you have what is called uh, world currencies. So how do you define what is the value of a glass, of a Coca-Cola, of uh, oil, of gold, of Bitcoin? It's still using the centralized value, which is dollar, for example. You are right in saying that many people are looking at the assets um, uh, as the means of um, the form of a a means of value. Now, in the core pass application, the services are going to have a value which people can relate to, which they can say, okay, well, it's valued in so much. So when you have a look at barter trade, for example, um, you have tomatoes and potatoes. So, so many tomatoes is to the value of potato. And, but these are actually market related values, which are defined in a centralized type of currency. So even if the price spike of the core token and of core coin itself goes up, this doesn't mean that the, um, that the expenses is going to go up. Of course, you know, if you have a look at Bitcoin, you can, you can relate to it like this in the, in the day of pizza, pizza day. You know, someone bought 10,000 <laughs> um, uh, Bitcoins for, for a pizza, which, um, you know, in today's aspect, you would say, are you absolutely crazy and insane? This is probably what's going to happen as the market grows and as the coin grows itself. But the value of the pizza back then versus to the value of the pizza today, it was still 5 euro, 10, 10 euro or $10. I don't know what was the real value of that pizza itself. But that value was defined in the dollar value, which was at that current market. And the same is going to be in the core pass is that it's got a stipulated value, which is currently assigned to as euro and or as dollar um, you can define that actually so that you have some 
means of understanding what is the value that you are actually paying, whether it is in a different uh, currency. I mean, it's the same as when you travel to the UK or you travel to South Africa or you travel to the US or to Asia, there's different currencies. You don't always know what is the different value. Um, specifically here in uh, Slovakia, we have uh, Czech Republic, which is just you know, 60 kilometers away from here, and they've got the Czech crowns. When you fly to Romania, they've got lei. Um, the value that you're doing there, you're always taking it back to something that you're comfortable with, but the value still stays the same market-related value that is there. So your price will remain the price that you can uh, relate to. Uh, it's just the means of value that's going to change in the token itself and in the coin itself that you're going to pay, or the amounts. No question. The ecosystem is pretty vast of what you as a company are building on top of your, your blockchain. Um, I've personally noted and, and said that it feels like there's been a lot of iterative development. You can see how there are some of the best learnings and what I view as some of the best features and most interesting projects in the Web3 space. You've taken learnings from those and found ways to apply real world use case and develop them into something that's a really fascinating suite of products. How difficult is it to maintain, develop, grow, and also ultimately explain the value of to those that are new to the ecosystem? Well, first and foremost, um, the approach that we like to take here is uh, we have quite a vast team and we do a lot of research. We do constant research. We have people that are dedicated primarily to looking at what's happening in the market, what applications are actually out there, what is taking place, what are the new um, developments. We are primarily, you know, focused on news and articles and have a look at what's what's happening there. And then we are uh, part of many other places where we um, uh, have a look at what, what is what is currently in the market. The next thing that you need to do is, is you need to evaluate what is the desire of the market and what is the purpose? And, um, you know, you can't just look at trends and say, well, this is the latest trend. You have to think a little bit further of, um, well, if this is the trend right now, how will it evolve? And there is some form of prediction that you have to try and uh, take into account uh, before you make a decision of how you're actually going to do a particular thing. If we just take the essence of Core Pass and how it grew over the years of development, um, you know the the goal was always a platform where you can be in control of your data and that you have a singular place where you can um, trust and utilize without the need of having to do it in so many different platforms. The same process over and over. But having that goal, how do you apply it? And this is where you have to start looking at what is currently in the market and what would be the use case for it and define the use case. And then you have to try and make a um, assessment on how would I use it? How would someone else use it? So what we do is, is when we talk about functions, we actually have a brainstorming session where we discuss how would you use it with our team members. And we also sometimes have this discussion with other people um, who we trust and stipulate, okay, well, this is what we were, what we were thinking of doing. Um, what's your take on it? And asking opinions about it to try and see if we can formulate the best way forward for it. Um, to take it out of um, another type of uh, perspective, you know, having this vision and and building an ecosystem we've had to do a lot of 
um, investigation into how economies are working and how uh, people are reacting to certain uh, aspects in these in in these applications which they have available. And in the end, um, you know, it comes down to workflow processes. It comes down to um, traceability, authenticity. It comes down to application uh, and deployment. And um, in the end, if you're building an ecosystem, you know, I, I like to look at it in, in the perspective of Apple and of uh, Android right now with Google Play of, of, of how things are working so seamlessly. You, you know, if you get a new Apple TV, you just put the phone nearby and the next moment everything's synced, it sets up the Wi-Fi for you automatically, it takes everything from the device itself. So it becomes, a, a, and the reason why they can do that is, is because they have this trusted form of communication within that ecosystem. Now, this is exactly what we said. Things, things are moving faster. Things are moving um, in a way that you want ease of use. But there is, like we had a conversation earlier about sometimes you have to look at security versus usability, which is always a discussion in, in our development. And these are the things that, we, that, that we've had to have a look at to be able to build an ecosystem that can cross communicate. And it starts off with the basis that first you need a communication layer then you need a ledger, then you need um, user management. From user management, then you can start defining the rest of the use cases that can be applied within that network. Um, to use an example, today the internet is what it is because of applications and how we are utilizing it and how it was distributed and, and how uh, it has become part of our lives. Now, when the internet started, it was primarily, the use case was to send a message or to send an email. Then Google came with search engines to have websites so that we could have more information. Then applications started being built so that you can buy things online. Then it started going into gaming so that you can transfer data and actually have profiles. You can do LAN games, you can do uh, playing with peers all over the world. So it just started snowballing and rolling into a whole new different environment. And this is basically why we built the ecosystem and why we, we did it the way that we've done it. Of course, right in the beginning, it was, it all started with one application, which was Tuktoki which is our e-commerce application and was primarily only to split a payment. Uh, all the payment gateways and banks didn't want to do this. So in the end, Rastislav actually came to, to me and he said to me, listen, we can do it with an exchange. So we started looking at exchange and he started explaining to me like how we can use cryptocurrency and how we can actually go into it using like Bitcoin or, or something like this. And then when we explained it to Michael, Michael said, well, okay, let's look at the adoption and Michael being a workflow specialist and being, um, you know, as, as experienced as he is in, in various different industries, started explaining to us of what is the importance of the blockchain itself also. And in the end, we then said, okay, well, if we're building this ledger, then we can actually start building these things. And we started seeing the opportunities of what is currently actually deployed in a Web3 environment. It was Web2 back then, and then it became Web3, but it was already, we could start seeing the potential which allowed us to grow. Um, one of the big challenges, of course, uh, is to define uh, code tech itself and, and all the services, and also to define you know, the entire ecosystem. But it starts with the first thing. It starts with a network, which and a, and a blockchain technology, and then a communications network. And then it starts with a digital identity so that you can enter into the ecosystem. Once we've proven that, I think the adoption will come much easier because people will start understanding how the technology works and become comfortable with the new form of adaption and solution that's out there. Fantastic. There we go. We're done. Right. Was this good? Was it painful? 
No. Yeah. <laughs> it was difficult questions, though. Uh, I'm Matej Korni, and I'm the CMO of the company. And the uh, use case itself, uh, mm, maybe can I tell something about my stories, which I came here and started to work with that with the guys. Uh, so basically, I was in the cryptocurrency space even before the first bull run came out. I uh, I had built one of the first communities in our country. We were so excited about the crypto itself. So it was the beginning of my interest for cryptos. We started. I started to build first communities in uh, in Slovakia. We was mainly interested for trading. Uh, we analyzes all these projects. And in the meantime, I also had my marketing agency. I did a lot of businesses almost in every area. I was not only in crypto, but I built a lot of uh, other businesses. And after that, I came to the point that uh, I wanted to build my own project uh, called Neuronigma. But uh, at the time, there was not so many developers uh, close to me, which can be in cooperation. So somehow I met Rasislav. First meeting was about our cooperation, but after that, uh, I never started to build this project. It was not so easy. Uh, and after some time, uh, Rasislav called me to, to, to one meeting for cafe, and we started to talk about, and uh, yeah. He asked me whether we, I don't want to be maybe part of the group of this project, and uh, we started uh, like that with Rasislav and uh, uh, with uh, Core itself. So this is the story, very short story of for this. So I was talking to Michael about the difference between Core and a lot of other projects that have seen a lot of hype. And then as a result, it collapsed. The power of just the community has been shown over the last 18 months to not be enough to sustain a project. Mm -hmm. Why, from your perspective as the CMO, have you taken such a different approach to a lot of the projects that have seen a lot of hype over the, the last 18 months? Exactly for that, because I saw all the market crashes, all the scammy projects and all these uh, situations, which was all, all, all these projects, which was built mainly on the hype. And I said, no, we will not do that, that in the same way. We are not creating hype before we can deliver quality tech and the apps. We are built, for, we will first deliver quality products, quality the apps, quality services and blockchain itself. And after that, marketing will came automatically. <laughs> of course, we have the plan in the plan to reach medias and uh, some kind of influencers, but we are not doing it in the same way. We don't want to do that in, in the in, or we don't want to approach the situation, then there will be a lot of expectation even before we deliver something real. So, first of all, to deliver the apps like Corpus, Ping Exchange, blockchain already is running, and every year to deliver new D app and new services. We want to reach more and more uh, financial institutions, FES, SPS, financial service providers crypto asset service providers to cooperate with us. So this is the, this is the strategy behind. We, we are not in position that we want to create hype, even before we can deliver something real and quality tech. So what's been the main focus uh, for, for your role, given the relative low profile of the project? Where have you been looking to see where the value is in building a community when you're not just trying to create hype? Look, uh, this was this uh, this was not so hard how to start to build communities. The first of all, when I came to the to the project, I said we need to show transparency. So first step was to create, uh, not to create to start uh, talk to the audience. So as I said, when I, when, I, when I came, I said, guys, I told the founders, you need to start talking to your audience because they need to see you as the founder that you really care of your audience. So we started with some kind of live streams and this was really good 
the, the first live stream, which was last year, where all the co-founders was. This was this has, this live stream has really good uh, reactions. So we started to build in it, build in the marketing or communities on the fact that the founders starting starting to talk to the community itself. Do we do we are also very special in a way that, for example, CEO Oki, he's also very active in uh, basic chats. He's open to talk with uh, any individual, and this is what I really likes how we are doing this. And yes, after that came some uh, interviews, uh, some articles, but we are really doing in this, this in a way that we are not spending a ton of money for marketing. We, are, we have our own strategy and we are building stable community members. We don't want to have community members which will come and after coin is listed or something, uh, they will just uh, sell their tokens or cryptos or coins and uh, we will not see, see the community member. We want to have stable community members which trust uh, for the, our project ecosystem. They will use our D apps. Uh, yeah. What's, what, what's your reaction when you see companies like Crypto.com hiring Matt Damon, VeChain sponsoring the UFC, spending hundreds of millions of dollars to rename sports stadiums? My reaction for that is you know, this is very easy. Each company can do that if they have cash flow and money. It's not hard to do that. You just need to put table the money and you can hire any popular actor if he's open for cooperation. So, yeah, in, in, uh, in one, uh, on, yes, there is also one good thing on that. Yes, they, they, are, they are help to crypto be more popular in uh, wide range, wide, more, more spectrum or to bring more awareness for the crypto itself but uh, on the other hand uh, you can ask yourself uh, whether is this is the best way that you really need to push it so much to the mainstream because after that if we are so much in mainstream we are we are approach we, we can see this uh, collapses because more and more companies are, are they want to follow this trend and they are building something which is not transparent and not built on a stable financial environment risk management is nowhere you know this is so so it this concerned me so much the recent events that came out with ftx etc that yes on the one hand yes it's it is good for the popularity of crypto but on the other hand i don't think so we are in still we are not at the stage with the regulatory framework still not uh, ready to be so much in mainstream. We still, need, we still need to build stable regulations, stable framework to be sure about functionality and about that fact that there will be only companies which can guarantee safety of the funds and they can, uh, they can provide only this, uh, safety environment for the people. So too early, basically. Essentially, do you think it's too early to be trying to push to, to mainstream? Yeah, you can see that the regulations are still not as clarified as we need. So there are still some uh, some uh, consideration how it will looks like. Mm -hmm. But first, we need to have stable regulations. What's the day to day like from me as a journalist coming to visit over the the weekend? Obviously, the office is empty at the moment because we are here over the weekend. You guys, I haven't really noticed much of a feeling of resentment about having to be here over the weekend. It seems like a really close team. Um, what, what's it like being a part of such a team? Uh, I can say, this is a very simple answer. I can say we are, we are almost like a family. In our company in our, and in our team, is not is nobody who is not really like a friend. In our company, we are our our daily routine is like we are joking, we are laughing with each others. There is no we are really like uh, chairman can uh, if for example Michael is open to talk with anybody in the in the, uh, in our team, he's joking with anybody. Each others are the friends, so it's not just about the career and the company itself. We have really good relations also in. Uh, private lives. We can talk to each other about 
other things, not just about the company. So yeah, this is beautiful feeling. I, I, really, I really appreciate that I can be the part of this uh, company because the relations here are really beautiful. We are almost like a family. There's been, obviously at the moment, a lot of companies collapsing or laying off mass amounts of employees at the moment, given the, the current economic conditions. Um, with that downturn, do you see it as potentially like begrudgingly or unfortunately being a opportunity for a project like yourself to come in as the industry rebuilds? Do you think there's an opportunity there? I think this is the best opportunity. This event, events which came out, we can build our marketing on that because we're really delivering exactly the tools which are built against these situations. For example, Corpus itself uh, is built to help regulation, the, to cover all regulations framework. So, for example, if uh, some crypto exchange wants to be sure about the funds and the clients, they can just uh, integrate Corpus. So we can cover a lot of areas, but this is only Corpus. If financial asset service provider wants to be sure about the security of the data of the customers, uh, security of the funds, and uh, to be sure to be fully compliant with the regulations, Corpus is the answer. After that, uh, we can talk about uh, how secure our funds if we are using uh, Corpus itself. We are not using a hot wallet or something like that. In Corpus is are integrated. Uh, Corpus is uh, integrated with cold wallets, so you have all of yours private keys under your under your control. So you can. This is this is especially really good uh, information for all these people which don't want to have the assets on the exchanges. This is this is a uh, very easy answer for all these uh, traders because they will be sure about the security of the funds. So in terms of the marketing message, how, how are you going to be able to balance the sensitivity of people have lost a lot of money? There's been some tragic stories of people investing at the moment. Um, there could be easy pushback for any companies going forward over the next, say, two years, promoting crypto projects as, say, profiting on other people's uh, misery or um, pain. How do you think you can position your marketing to show that you're doing something to help solve that problem rather than looking to profit off other people's uh, downfall? Mm -hmm. First of all, we will deliver quality tech, which will work. So we don't need to, need to say nothing else because it will be quality the apps, which, are, which will run. But after that, of course, uh, we will talk about that we are creating uh, the f ecosystem, the, f the new environment with the D apps and services for every area of, of life. So we are trying to build something uh, that you will, have core, you will have your core pass and you will cover and you can log into all the D apps. What do you need? For example, you want to chat with your family or friend, you will have the, the apps from Core. You want to stream, you will have, you will have Think platform. You want to have your business meeting, you have the platform from Core. You want to send money, you have the banking platform from Core. And uh, this is basically the, the ecosystem which covering all the, the applications which you need for daily basis so this is the goal and how how we want to maybe tell to the to the to everyone that we want to build maximum sec security environment for all your applications which you need so you'll control your data you will control your control your assets you will control your video content you will control your messages nobody can data breach you or to create to store your identities we want to create something uh, really different that the, the whole environment of the applications. So 
if you will be dedicated for core, you, we can cover all the activities for you or, and all the applications which, which you need for your, for your, on your daily basis. Do you think with the goal in mind of what core is looking to achieve, does this feel like more than just a job? Of course it is more than a job. I'm not doing this for a job. I am doing this for the passion. And uh, also all my team members are doing it for the passion. We are in a situation that we are not focused for any fundraising because <laughs> you can see that, that we are not doing this in this way. We are not the, the projects like 95% of projects which are first trying to reach some VCs. Okay, help us to grow, help us with cash flow. No, we are doing it for, for the passion itself to create something with value and uh, which will be used by the, which to build something which will be mass accepted. And for me, I'm waiting for the moment uh, when I can see that uh, someone else will start using our applications, our D apps, and he will be satisfied. And this is everything what I need to have or to, to see. If the people will be satisfied with the safety of our D apps network itself, Nothing else. I, I, this is everything what I need to have or to see in the in the end. Who's going to benefit the most when the blockchain and all the um, applications are fully deployed? Mm, I do mean now from uh, in uh, benefit from in which. Uh, so yes, yeah, so what types of people is it? For people in rural areas, is it for people in Western countries? Oh, this is very hard to answer because you know. Core blockchain itself uh, giving the opportunities for all the companies to build their own the apps. After that core pass, I think it will be mostly used and uh, the benefits will be, ben the most benefiting will be the companies like financial asset service providers and crypto asset service providers because they can be sure about the safety of the clients and the funds and the regulations. After that, uh, ping exchange will be maybe more about the daily, um, not daily traders, but, but about the traders itself, that they can be sure about the security and how fast is the platform. Uh, thing and meeting, of course, influencers, uh, basic brands. Uh, Luna Mesh, of course, this is the, this is something absolutely different. Luna Mesh is the project which can change everything. And this is, this is, uh, yeah, this is, as you said, the Luna Mesh can uh, help uh, maybe the world the most in, uh, in the meaning of connections, to deliver free connection to everyone. So this is, yeah, this is something different. Luna Mesh is a really beautiful project. And if Luna Mesh will uh, be successfully developed and delivered to the market, yeah, it will change everything. Luna Mesh will be will be a beautiful project and can help uh, to spread connection everywhere in the world. Just the idea behind. What's your personal favorite part of the, pro the project? No, the, the middle Namesh or the other Namesh. projects? The whole core. What is my whole favorite ecosystem. project? You're personally for you. It's very hard to say about Yes, I'm really looking forward for Corpus because I really want to help to, especially crypto space, to build uh, finally safety environment with all the regulations and stuff, uh, etc. But after that, uh, I really think that uh, thing and meeting will be really, really successful project because there is a guarantee of uh, security of your content. It will be based on peer-to-peer -peer as well. So the, the speed of the platform will be really nice. Businesses can start using a meeting platform for, for their internal meetings, which will be maximum, maximum secure. So they can talk about uh, anything what they want. But uh, I have one uh, favorite app, the app, which is Heyo, which is this chat uh, application which will come uh, together with Luna Mesh. And this will be really beautiful that you can chat and send messages which, with your friends, even without the internet. This will be, yeah. But all of these applications are 
in some way I like of all of them. Well, we also forgot to mention TokToki, which is the e-commerce platform. This also this platform has also big potential to change how this e-commerce platform will, will looks like in the future. So, with so many different, with, with so many different uh, D apps in involved in the project, what's your as a CMO? What's your biggest challenge? Mm. Uh, Look, I'm so sure about the quality of the tech that I don't have so much challenges. I am more than sure that we will deliver quality tech and quality the apps. We already delivered quality network blockchain, which is running very well. So I don't feel that like that I am. I will have some challenges because I know what we will deliver and how the quality will be in the end. What made you decide to go into the blockchain space? Well, it's actually a long story. Um, we started off in uh, uh, like the beginning of the 2000s, built equip uh, uh, using equipment in the GPRS network to do closed loop banking system software that we've developed. And um, ever since then, we've sort of like built around that and also around uh, systems of connectivity and you know sending out uh, whether it was video whether it was uh, you know we we've actually been also in the video capturing industry uh, sometime and uh, then we developed an, uh, a platform where we wanted to split payments uh, in an e-commerce environment specifically on the Tizen platform of Samsung uh, at the time we recruited Rastislav and um, he introduced us to the blockchain and the ability to split payments and he said well we could use that and we started to uh, to investigate the opportunity to go into blockchain so that was somewhere in the beginning of well end of 2013 beginning 2014. So you, you were starting to develop in the blockchain space like even pre-Ethereum then? Yeah, I would say that, you know, uh, when Rastislav joined us, you know, he was already well, uh, let's say, educated in the blockchain industry. He's already done some development at the time. Um, you know, we, one has to be careful to say some of these things, but I believe that, you know, uh, tokenization is not something that was, you know, founded in the late uh, 2000s. It was already you know, established, you know, in the days of long before by IBM, we're doing some tokenization, which we have used some of the technology in our payment uh, uh, systems, which we used uh, the GPRS networks where we tokenized data already at that time. Uh, I can also say that uh, the same with uh, smart contracts, you know, it, it was already done in the 50s. So, you know, it was just refined. And the industry has just re in, re in, in developed into this direction, you know, and that is basically, in my opinion, you know, let's say the, the very much of blockchain. And this is also, you know, where we see ourselves when we started to develop in the blockchain, we realized that there were some shortcomings and that was why we investigated, you know, to develop a, let's say, more uh, scalable, faster, more secure environment. That's how Core actually started, and um, from you know, based on historical development, uh, that was already in the market available. So within the the market, there's obviously been a lot of speculation over the last eighteen months. We've seen Bitcoin go up above sixty thousand, now come down to sixteen thousand. There's been plenty of other projects that have seen even more dramatic um, volatility. Your approach to the project is, does not appear to have been to push the hype and the potential because from my position looking in, there is a massive amount of potential here and you see a lot of other projects say just building on hype and hoping that that hype and community will, will, will drive the project through. Why have you taken such a different approach to some of the other projects in the space? You, you, you know, I think one of the key things that we have to... Um to evaluate is, you know, you have to separate uh, cryptocurrencies 
from the blockchain industry itself. You know, developing in the blockchain is a software environment. It creates a certain form of trust and transparency and it develops something of where there are, you know, proper record keeping and accountability done in the right way. So that was, you know, in my opinion, always one of the key things that um, one should be careful uh, to connect the two where value is driven by token or by coin simply for the fact that um, uh, it is there to create um, some form of income or wealth or something like that. In, in our opinion, wealth follows, uh, or let's say cryptocurrency value follows that of technology and the ability of you know delivering uh, the technology that actually does the next level in terms of, of 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 delivering that what is required in the market and to bring bring new cutting edge uh, technology to the market. So wealth follows that. One must be thinking that you know not in terms of driving value from a hype that is created by marketing. This is probably one of the biggest problems in the blockchain industry or let's say the crypto industry is the promises or are the promises that are made and probably difficult to keep or probably difficult to deliver. Uh, that's what was our approach from the beginning is that we have to deliver first what we think it is possible and to research and to do the right things to be able to deliver what we have done, you know, to date with the core blockchain, which really is, you know, let's say a very good piece of software that is amazing and it actually has amazing opportunities and opening the market for a complete new uh, dimension in how blockchain can actually be deployed in a real life. I think one of the most interesting things from a, like a, a layer one perspective, which, which you're obviously building, is other projects I speak to that are similar in nature in terms of layer ones are solely focused on the potential of the protocol for other people to develop on. Um, and one of the biggest sort of pushbacks and criticisms of the blockchain space as a result can be, okay, well, what are the real world use cases? Whilst I've been here over the last two days, I've only seen examples of real world use cases of how blockchain can be used to solve issues with internet connectivity, with payments, um, with digital identities. How do you believe others building on the chain will be able to add value given the amount of value in real world use cases you're already deploying? Where else do you see um, people building on the, on, the, on the blockchain being able to find new and innovative ways to, to build on what you've already done? Um, I think that um, the core blockchain and the ecosystem we've built around it it's not something that will remain static as what we've developed it. We believe that, you know, everything, because everything is basically open source, um, it's, you know, in my opinion, I think that people will take this open source uh, platforms uh, like the War Money platform, like the uh, platform of, of uh, um, uh, Core Pay, uh, of the ping exchange maybe in a lesser manner, you know, which is, you know, a, a, a hybrid exchange. Um, and then, of course, you know, you are looking into uh, other aspects of, you know, how the core blockchain's gateway, which is actually the core pass, is going to develop. You know, in, in, in my opinion, you know, they, this is really where you connect the individual to that what is the attribute. And that attribute, you know, consists of mountains of different uh, opportunities, whether that be, you know, financial instrument, whether that be a, a permission, a task, a, uh, an authorization, a simple, you know, access to a building. This is where I see where you will now see very, uh, uh, 
few of, of um, many companies starting to take that and really develop that into the next level of what they can implement into their companies. I really think that there will the 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 the, the ecosystem itself allows for companies itself to adopt it and then to develop it further and integrate it in their current software. You see, the, the thing is, what is very interesting, I think in our industry is that one could not think that you can draw a line through software that's already existing. This is why we build the connector so that you can actually integrate with other blockchains, other blockchain environments, and also that of uh, um, cloud platforms. If you don't allow that type of, or you focus on a really uh, a, a, a monolistic type of approach, then your, your blockchain sort of like narrows down into this area. Now, uh, the, the core blockchain is actually the people's network. It's not something that was built for the fact that we wanted the coin. We built it if, because we needed the network. The coin is just the fact that it is actually the facilitator to, to pay for the network that it has got to be able to transact. So you have to, re, to, to reward the people who are actually you know, running the blockchain on behalf of you who would like to use it. And I think these are the things that I really think we will see a lot of development. Um, it's probably early stages for us to see. We've now seen some really nice corporates who want to integrate. We are in the accounting industry. We've been seeing this uh, in the accounting environment where we are now integrating in an in a, in a, in a environment where they are using uh, um, Microsoft uh, 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 server platforms and uh, where we, 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 we see um, Amazon platforms being sort of like integrated now into the network and it becomes really interesting. We are working on a SAP project uh, for integration right now um, and I think this whole uh, environment of how the, the blockchain is really deploying into a real world environment is where the big opportunity will come and the use cases will come and uh, we, we're looking into also, of course, we believe that, that we have a, 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 a system and maybe Rastislav will expand a little bit on that, where we have a library of, of smart contracts and where we motivate developers to actually uh, w uh, make available from this library, which is the uh, um, uh, idea is to grow this environment um, for, 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 for integration. You've been working in the, the tech industry uh, for quite some, some time. Um, it, it's quite clear from conversations I've had with, with Oki how that has uh, positioned you to, to launch such a project. Talking to members of the team, they are very geographically diverse. Um, there's a lot of them that are um, quite young how is it working with such a team, with both um, a young team and a globally diverse team, being the, the chairman of the board? How, how do you find those relationships and how do you find the sort of the day-to-day -day working? Well, it's quite interesting. I mean, I'm 65 years old, so uh, yeah, this is a, a complete uh, different environment uh, to be involved in if you are not ready to really be able to be led by younger people. One of the key things that I think that um, I uh, am always so 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 I want to say so blessed to have you know these young guys around me, and I can really you know almost say that we have and it's it I would be it's a dangerous statement to make it but you know Oki is basically in the middle age environment. Uh, and Rastislav in the middle age environment. And then we have the real 20 year olds and 19 year olds. And to see how, you know, this contribution is coming together, leading a team like that, I think, you know, and I'm really involved in the day to day operations of the company. I'm, I'm involved in the development. I'm involved in the business development side of the business. I'm involved in the financing of the business and the dynamics around that. Uh, you can only do that if you rely on uh, the abilities of the people who have 
been selected by us and it's a really careful selected team that we've built over the years. Uh, I think that I can say that m more or less more than 80% of the people uh, that we have, you know, that have started working with us are still with us. The moment you start working, they get so intrigued into this project because it is such an interesting project and it is so uh, integrating and, 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 and an integral part of each one of these projects. You know, we have people in the core parts uh, working, which, which comes from the blockchain uh, cryptography team who are now, you know, uh, working in, in, in these teams on, on, on the releasing part of it and to see how this team has grown and how these people are working together to actually make it work. And sooner or later when we will start working on the team platform, it's exactly the same. Uh, we have some of the cryptography people in the Luna Mesh environment where, you know, certain things in the Luna Mesh has to be, you know, cryptographically analyzed and, 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 and researched. And these are the really interesting environments. So I could say that the diversity of our team and the fact that they are, you know, so geographically spread gives us the, I want to call it competitive edge because we have almost from, you know, we, we have in any way in every continent of this world, we have people working with us. And that's the beauty behind it. And that's actually the exciting part about it. So we have a, a yes, exactly, very diverse uh, team in terms of people and a diverse team in terms of, you know, a very big spread of age from 20 to like really not so. I mean, obviously, um, Oki is the CEO, is, is your son. Um, but Beyond that, the, the core team that I've met over this weekend, there really does seem to be a sense of genuine uh, respect and like a family culture, which is the kind of the goal of a lot of companies that like you've seen the whole, the, the, the original Google like environment of trying to place, create a place of work where people want to go, um, can be very difficult to balance to actually allow for proper productivity and also for genuine, um, relationships to form how how have you managed to achieve that and also do you feel it's something that you're able to achieve with the rest of the team outside of this office obviously I've spoke to a few of them on the phone but obviously I can't get quite a grasp of what the culture is like outside of these eight walls or whatever it is I, I could say that um, maybe the one thing is I have really been traveling quite a bit in the world. I have worked in multiple countries and Okert has traveled with me from a very young age. And I can say that, you know, the diversity of our ability to see, you know, different cultures and to see the different opportunities that we have, you know, from, you know, making these cultures part of our system. You know, I think it's something like, it has a balance of some form of you have to respect each other uh, at each and every time, you know, um, how difficult it may be on times that we are, you know, not always in agreement with what we are doing. And, you know, it, you know, everything looks always like really in big harmony, but it is not necessarily always in, 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 in harmony. It means that we do have our differences and we do have that, but we manage that in a humanitarian way. We manage that in a decent way. When we don't agree with each other, we really try to keep it, you know, as easy as possible when we work through the differences and when we have to get a decision, because this is sometimes very difficult because some of the decisions are critical in terms of our project. It is completely, you know, direct differences that we something sometimes take sometimes it is about the ability the balance between security and the balance between uh, uh, scalability and things like that that you have to make these decisions and you know certain people have different views on you know which are more focused on security more on scalability and then you have your business development guy that says but hey guys we really need to get this into the project you can't sell it if we can't do it like this so essentially, I think that, yes, uh, I think that because we have really a high respect for each other, and this is a culture that we also, when we, ch when we look at somebody who comes to work with us, 
you, you know, hockey makes always the, the he and Rusty stuff say the last thing they ask is about qualifications. The first thing they do is they evaluate skills and then they look at the fact on whether people can work for us. Now, our team guys, the team leaders, they actually do the first evaluation of a CV. So the very first thing they look at is whether the guy will fit into the team and whether they will fit the culture of the team. Because you know our teams are really vast, different people from different countries and different cultures and different systems. And th this whole platform is built around the fact that we trust our team leaders. Then we have a shortlist and from the shortlist comes the interviews. And that is the only time when you know we the questions are coming on whether the guy can fit into the team. And I think that was one of our most successful things is the fact that we've built a team which has kind of like the same humanitarian values. And we, we, we kind of, and it doesn't matter from which culture you come, because culture and value is not something, you know, they, they, they go hand in hand with each other because it all goes back to respect. Mm -hmm. Lastly, um, we're currently going through uh, quite a large downturn in terms of a bear market. Um, centralized exchanges are obviously falling down left, right and center. What's your vision for rebuilding of the crypto industry, if that's what's required? And where do you think core blockchain will fit during the hopeful next bull market whenever that comes? Um, in terms of, uh, I would say, rebuilding trust in the blockchain industry, um, I think that the trust in blockchain industry is something that uh, I want to call it something like uh, you earn that from the fact that you really deliver the technology that would bring the necessary transparency. The biggest issue today is to understand where collateralization is lying, where you are looking at when, where, how to protect the lender in the proper way, how to protect the people who are bringing the funds into the system, how to actually allocate what is real ownership when it comes to, 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 to a DeFi environment or permissions or uh, systems like that. The core pass, in my opinion, is probably the gateway to a large part of the success. In, in, in our blockchain, in, in, uh, and I don't want to call it in the core blockchain, because it's not really our blockchain. It is really the blockchain of the people. In the, block, in the blockchain, core blockchain, we have core pass as a gateway. The core pass, you can do nothing without you know having a digital identity you can really do very little and you know as you will see the regulator will now come probably with you know really big changes in the market and we will see the current financial uh, uh, industries uh, regulations being in, uh, 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 imposed onto blockchain or let's say uh, exchanges that will protect investors and it will probably come you know really fast in the next couple of uh, a year or beginning of you know I would like to say even in the next coming six months we will see severe changes in terms of regulation but in in my opinion I see really the the the, the success behind rebuilding is really to rebuild trust and the trust comes with technology showing that the technology can work indicating that the technology and i think that with the core pass together with a decentralized exchange like the core like ping exchange uh, which actually you know uh, in which you have seen yesterday how we actually transact and that funds actually doesn't go into a hot wallet and this is really where the big dangers are. The hot wallet monies are really, really kept in really small environments where you are really, you know, in a different traded environment. And then, then the next thing that I could say is where do I see core blockchain? I see core blockchain as one of the key developers platforms for the future to create a, a blockchain environment in a proper proof of work or um, uh, environment where you can really, you know, have a decentralized environment. I really believe that 
the, the danger is when you are looking into staking and when you are looking into permission blockchains, these are the areas where you will find that there will be a lot of resistance from public investment and from public support. And that's where I see, because really with the core blockchain, we've reached the point where we can actually manage the scalability. We can actually manage the affordability. And it is really an eco-friendly platform. So it is not expensive to mine. It's not crazy amounts of money that is required. You can even do it in a waste energy environment where you can use it where, 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 where energy is just simply used when and as an, on an as and when basis if it's not uh, required. So the blockchain is really very diversely, you know, uh, operatable in a IoT environment. We believe that the decentralization will become stronger and stronger as IoT devices are deployed all over the world and uh, to, through all the continents. So do you just want to introduce yourself and your role in the project? Yeah, sure. My name is Rastislav Vašička. I'm of, originally from Slovakia. And I start uh, from, from mass media business and continue with the blockchain from early stages, like starting 2010, then continuing with 2014 with the finding of Ethereum and smart contracts. But I was with the blockchain basically from beginning and I'm the CIO in the company. Then I'm just looking uh, into the technologies, into the programming and all what is connected with the blockchain. Blockchain, I think, is uh, our future for proving the transaction to making the smart contracts and ma many other uh, use cases. Then we as a company uh, building on the blockchain, it's uh, other decentralized way. What would be your response to people that say blockchain is just a slow database? Uh, yeah, first of all, I will explain what is the database and what is the blockchain, what is the blockchain for. Yeah, this is very important and what blockchain guarantees us. This is not only a database which are uh, quite stored on several servers, but this is decentralization. This is more important the part of the blockchain. You can trust the information and they are decentralized. If one data center went down or several others, you have still these databases where are stored in different places and this is the power of the blockchain. And there is also several other you know, information that you can find about the blockchain and which can give the blockchain a really strong hand. Uh, but uh, right now we, we can see many blockchains are in the market and many new coming and there are more and more improvements. I will just emphasize only one thing then really look what is the blockchain and what is not the blockchain look into the technology, what they can offer us and how decentralized they are. Where do you think core technologies overall, the project, where do you see the biggest impact being? Core is about the people, about the daily life in your uh, everyday life. And also the impact is for uh, people who want to change the current system, how they are working right now. Because you see, the life is changing right now with or without the blockchain. But we are bringing to the people the power to change the life whenever they are, not only in, here in Europe, but also abroad, in the places where is the poverty. And they can also work with the uh, tools which we are giving them. Then I think, uh, is it some, something like also philanthropic way to find uh, the power for people, how they can sustain themselves and how they can start and using the digital economy? You say you've been involved in blockchain since 2010. You were interested in, in Ethereum while it launched. Why did you decide to start and be a part of a project like this rather than say, becoming one of the say, core developers within the Ethereum ecosystem. Obviously it's a decentralized environment. Anyone can contribute code, given your skill set. What made you decide to, to, to start and join a project like this? First of all, we're starting with our use cases and we are looking for some uh, blockchain which can cover our needs. There are many blockchain in the market, but 
none of this ideology to uh, full fit with the working application, to not change them completely, but keep them and continue with the blockchain way. And also uh, like give the power for people. Is it, we are strongly uh, recommended to do the things in the decentralized manner. And I, we were following that. Then one day, I remember it with Oki and Michael, we're speaking, what we'll do now? We have plenty of blockchain, just develop a token or do something uh, our own. And I never forgot the uh, thing that Michael told us, uh, it's time for our own blockchain. And I was white, my face was fully white. Then I find out this is the right way to do. Is it little of the company history, what I'm saying, but also we are just putting there the power for people, decentralization, and also all the people can participate into the blockchain. Then I think it was the right way and the best way what we can do. It was there a lot of effort, but in the end, it's like fitting like a puzzle for our ecosystem. So you utilize um, a, a different type of uh, technology when it comes to mining and you are a, a new, a different version of a proof of work technology and you created this random Y algorithm rather than random X. Could you just explain a little bit about why you chose to do that and where you see the benefits and are there any downsides? Yeah, sure. Uh, we start with our team. We have quite a huge team about the cryptographers to discussion what we'll do, how we can incorporate uh, inside the blockchain also small IoT devices, how we can be energy uh, sufficient and also how we'll not just uh, put there so much uh, uh, effort in energy while still staying in a decentralized manner. The best answer was the algorithm random Y which we developed and we changed uh, multiple things uh, and constants in the algorithm that uh, fully fit with the small IoT devices. The next phase uh, was the testing, quite a lengthy testing with multiple devices which can uh, participate, which cannot participate into the model. Then we test also the current devices, we test the small IoT devices and we set up the algorithm that can fully fit in the small IoT devices and also like um, daily electronics uh, in point of view of uh, mobile phones and several others. Then this can participate in our blockchain and the bigger devices uh, like ASICs are excluded and also the GPU mining is excluded because it consumes so much energy for this kind of effort. Then we program the article this way that can support the small IoT devices and st still we can be proof of work, the fully decentralized manner and also we can uh, start mining with small IoT devices which are uh, energy uh, like uh, eco-friendly. This is one big thing. And also we have several other projects which can uh, uh, just uh, fulfill the ecosystem which you can also transmit the information uh, run the blockchain on devices and nodes and this will be really the big power of the decentralization for small IoT devices. Then we see the future, like your IoT devices are like, in, let's say in the still small area of the computing power, but is it going bigger and bigger? And I think it will not stop because uh, the producers are producing more powerful um, mobile phones, IoT devices for measuring and several other aspects. Then uh, this was our way how we can uh, basically encapsulate all this information to um, the vision of the blockchain and the vision for the use cases. So the last part of the question was, are there any downsides to that approach? Oh yeah. Well, um, there is the technical downsides because you not uh, you need to work in the technical way or a little stronger to like increase the number of transactions, increase uh, um, basically uh, the throughput of the transaction. And also, if you will use the smart contracts quite well, yeah, and you will have many use cases. You need to be also able to uh, transmit the information 
in a certain time. You cannot be like uh, late, yeah? Then we are using for a block seven seconds, which is enough for transmitting the information in most cases. And there is a lot of technical difficulties which need be improved, let's say like that. But we are working on it and I think we will be quite successful. We will introduce the next thing in the blockchain. Then mostly there is the technical difficulties which we can improve. But uh, we want to still stay in the decentralization and also give the people the power. So why not just go to proof of stake? Or start with proof of stake? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, like uh, there is the problem, the full decentralization. Staking, uh, you're giving the power for stakers, the people who hold uh, the amount. And also the proof of work is a uh, more democratic way, I, I would say. Uh, everybody can participate. We are not excluding the people. Everybody will get their rewards. And if we will improve the technology, then it will be more powerful than proof of stake. Vitalik argument was he views that proof of stake is more secure than proof of work. Do you agree with that analysis? Uh, actually, uh, I don't think so. Uh, if you are comparing the staking and proof of work, uh, proof of staking is a younger technology and there is a lot more to find out um, and test it. Yeah, Proof of work we have from beginning, basically. And if you like uh, decreasing the need or uh, the high machines and it will be more eco-friendly, is it more tested over the time? Then I think also with the decentralization uh, staking, you have also the people in the network and proof of work, everybody new can connect to the network. Then uh, everybody new connect and participate. Uh, is it more setup of the algorithm into the system? then I think the proof of work is on the good way, but still there is downsides in the technology that we need to improve. How do you feel like the merge in Ethereum changed the conversation around energy efficiency in blockchain? And do you feel that the pressure on blockchain projects to be more energy efficient is an argument that is being had in the correct manner. I was thinking that uh, some time ago, the thing is the current miners with the GPUs for Ethereum will not disappear. They will switch for another blockchain then I think there will be not simply like eliminated. There will still work. There is huge expenses, not only for a crypto, but also for other environments, which are in our uh, system, which we are using uh, like ATMs and for other uh, businesses, which we really need to count. Then I think the current miners will not disappear. Uh, of course, the staking uh, is like more friendly than like proof of work with the GPUs, but uh, still, uh, you are using some computers, the computers are disappearing. And I think um, if you can run it with a small IoT devices, this is a good way to go for sure. But um, it will be good also states that it's fully decentralized in that manner. Then I think we have huge expenses in case of ener energy and how efficient we can be with uh, blockchain and not blockchain ecosystem and also with the staking itself, because the staking is not running without the power, it's running with uh, uh, some kind of power which you need to make somewhere. Then we are also trying to do that uh, environmental friendly sources like solar panels and several uh, energy, which is waste energy, which we can run, and also that uh, decrease the uh, need of the energy. Another area with regards to uh, your consensus mechanism being proof of work, which is different to uh, other versions, is that you haven't defined a fixed supply. Why do you decide to go down that route? 
we were looking for some models which are already in the market. Bitcoin is fixed supplies, Ethereum is not. Uh, if we compare our technology inside also our project, we are publishing more and more in the ecosystem. That makes sense also don't have the fixed supplies because we'll use it for all these projects. Ethereum is in the similar way, they don't have fixed supply as well. And uh, I think uh, there is a big need for the core ecosystem and we want to bring a lot for our people, for a lot of the, for the community and this supply is simply needed to operate. Then everybody who can connect to the network, they will get their own part and we can also um, just project it back to the system. That will be more and more. You can see in other uh, blockchains, mm -hmm. there is certain ways how they can do it, but with a huge like portfolio, what we are bringing, I think it makes sense. So would you, would you say it's fair and that Bitcoin doesn't really have utility, it's more of an asset, whereas something like Ethereum and a lot of other projects that we consider to be Web3 are based on utility. And obviously the core coins and core tokens um, have a, a lot of utility in the way that they're used. Does that mean that it would be fair to suggest that the price of the token doesn't it's maybe not a project to speculate on price per se, because if the price goes up as the utility goes up, it becomes more expensive to interact with the network. Um, so what's your view on the sort of the future price of the token? Would you be happy if the token price went up to $60,000 per token? I really don't want to speculate about the pricing, but we are bringing the ping exchange uh, inside the project, which will like give you the exact price in the market. But a lot of people are studying our project, studying our ecosystem, and they see like a lot of potential inside there. And they, they can see the core tokens is used in this project and they are happy. Yeah, they're bringing also more and more uh, information for the people and more and more uh, the tools or the use cases inside the system and everywhere like you have core coin which is used as a blockchain for a fees you have a core token for payment for services then if you are running uh, the platform like Ting, or if you are just uh, uh, simply working on the blockchain yeah thing you need to pay the fees in core tokens and also in the core blockchain, if you are doing some transaction, you need to pay the fees or a very popular project, which we are releasing core pass, which is the, your digital identity. You can pay simply with your core tokens in your wallet. And there is much more, uh, like I, I can even say the Easter eggs because it's not even outside in the market, but is it something that people will uh, like to use or that people will be happy to use it, then I think a lot of information while releasing this application will came out that people will be happy to use the core token and core coin into the applications. Mm -hmm. I think where, where I'm, I'm getting at with it is so many projects are built on the foundation that the price of the token will go up through adoption. Whereas I've not really heard like talking about the tokens and the coins is, is probably one of the the last things that have been mentioned mostly over the last few days when I've been talking, it's all about the utility, what the project can bring to the world. And there's part of me that thinks of over the last, what are we now, 12 years, a lot of crypto has just been about price speculation um, and people talking about use cases coming or some base use cases available. Everything that you guys have talked about has been about real world use cases, how black blockchain can improve the lives of people. Would it be fair to say that the token is the sort of price of the token isn't doesn't have the same weight then put it as some other projects? Yeah, absolutely. We are not focusing in the price of the coin and the price of the token. We are focusing for a people, for a use cases and what we can bring to the people. The fact uh, that token and coin is used in the application is like a bonus 
for the price, for, of course. But uh, what we want to release uh, is help for the people. And these people should use the application and they will be, I hope, happy with that. We are trying to uh, uh, put inside the application a lot more functionality and everything what they can use. Not only with the connection with the internet, how we know it right now, but also with the new future of the internet, the decentralized internet. We name it as Internet to Zero, which they can uh, use the decentralized application in the ecosystem. And that opens like uh, absolutely new perspective into the blockchain environment itself. Because you are not speaking about D apps, you are not speaking about D apps dependent on the internet. But right now we are speaking about the new system. New whole the world, what can bring the equality for a people. And for that, we are just focusing for equality for a people. They can use the new form on digital economy. And if we are building the digital economy on, based on the blockchain, based on not only one blockchain, many good blockchain in the market, and we'll put the best into the application, it will be for a people big help in this uh, world. I think so. What's it like being the CAO of a project with so many different apps and applications uh, relying on interconnectivity through the same blockchain? Um, as I say, for me, I'm seeing some of the best parts of lots of different Web3 projects being built by your team. Is it difficult to make sure that everything works well together and is in a fit state to be released given that blockchain is the internet of value? Like when someone gets hacked or a mistake is made, there's financial impact straight away. How, how tough is that? Being the CIO, the big company is always really hard. You need the full focus. And if you have a so big spectrum of application, you need deeply, really deeply know what the application is uh, doing. Consult every day uh, with the uh, team leads about the functionality, what will coming in and so on. Uh, then is it really hard, but in the view of the application itself, we want to bring the best in the market. Then uh, blockchain should work smoothly. We are testing the testnet and we are testing the mainnet. The mainnet is live, but we need to test uh, also the application on mainnet as well. Then you need to just uh, make everything smooth be between the application, between the team. Then we are connecting inside and we are also building the tools, how the people can just implement more and more. Then uh, this connection should be established. Many people saying about the oracles, about the bridges and several other tools. And with the new cryptography like ED448, what we have in the blockchain, you need also build much, much more because of the cryptography. Cryptography give you the power, but on the other hand, give you a lot of responsibilities. These responsibilities you need to build, for example, new vault. Uh, we were using also HashiCorp vault, but we need to integrate many plugins like new cryptography inside that everything is way, uh, going smoothly. Then we are contributing also to other open source projects to make it more uh, adopted in the market. The adoption is very important in that case. And everything what we want to release, we will keeping it mostly open source because mainly um, maybe other people want to use it as well. And that is the right approach, make it open source and also publish for other people that the adoption will be good and the people can use it. I've spoken to other members of the team about the company uh, culture um, and the respect and relationships that, um, that the core team seems to have. How does that impact how you are able to deliver such a, a complex tax, task as you just mentioned you said it's very difficult um do you think the, the team culture here is unique yeah uh, in my whole career is it quite unique what i can say uh, we are here like in the central europe in bratislava 
which uh, we are friendly in the office and uh, people mm, is expecting like the big corporate nature here or something that we have so many products and so many employees and that thing but in my point of view you should stay friendly with the people you need to understand the people and only with the understanding of the people and giving them what they need for development and making them satisfied in your job in your position you will make the application better there is no like really uh, any sense to push the people to push it to the, this kind of corporate structure if they don't want to eat and is it more friendly nature and with the friendly nature we can simply deliver more and give more for people then I like it like that and everybody is calling me my name and uh, this is really good for the company itself I think. The current state of the, the crypto ecosystem um, trust has been rocked I think mm -hmm. given the collapse of FTX, Terra Luna earlier this year how do you think the current climate affects the next steps for the core blockchain? People are losing the trust and everything what we getting from mass media is like you asking yourself if the blockchain is the right way. But if you stay in the decentralization, if you stay secure, you can always have the way to make the application better, to deliver the best and you minimize the risk that somebody can be compromised. There is many more cases we don't even know, yeah? Or maybe it happened, it will happen soon. It will happen next few days. We didn't know. But it uh, happens in every kind of uh, digital aspect because the computer can make a mistake or the people just programming in the wrong way. But uh, we are trying to bring on the market the best what we can and uh, we will guarantee the people or we can put into the program the things what they can program it the way they would like and not seeing any other collapses in the market. For that also we are building the secure things what we uh, can uh, put there the stronger cryptography and many other things. Uh, as you see, like it's affecting the people, it's affecting the price and we cannot change it, but we can follow it, make it better and also do the investigation because uh, the right uh, people who are faulty or the parts of the software which are faulty should be fixed as soon as possible. Fantastic. Uh -huh. Okay, so it's our last night. I've been here since Friday. You've had the amazingly good grace to show me around, I think almost every inch of the office and I've met a whole ton of people involved with the projects. So first of all, just thank you very much for inviting me here. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, what has been your experience of the last few days? Well, um, firstly, it was absolutely Phenomenal, I like... I need to just sort you out a little bit there. Oh, let's put it up there. There you go. Okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so firstly, um, it's been absolutely phenomenal meeting you in person because I sort of like felt like on the interviews we connected, mm -hmm. um, you know, on a, on a different level, like a, more like a, a friendship kind of way. Um, and I actually... I learned a lot from you also with the way that you look at things and talk about things and your vision and things like this. Um, to be very honest with the, uh, with the experience, uh, I, I hoped it would have gone better. <laughs> so this is one of the things that uh, we, I don't think we've, we've caught on ca camera anywhere yet, um, but we had quite a few little t issues with some of the parts of the technology. But like I said to you kind of off camera, like. If there hadn't been any issues at all, I'd have been a lot more concerned. Yeah. Because the issues that came up were the types of issues that I've experienced in my own per, um, work life of running an agency for 15 years. They weren't the sort of issues that was like, oh, this clearly doesn't work. It was a bug with one part of it as a part of the overall ecosystem. 
Um, how do you feel the whole thing is coming together? Well, primarily the issues that we did run into was because we have several different versions of the application. And it's and the weekend yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. well, everyone's working. <laughs> you know, you saw I, I could call up anyone at any mm -hmm. given moment because we, we're all busy working towards the release. Um, and because of the different versions, different platforms have different versions integrated because they're still busy doing certain development, you know, of the final integration. And, um, you know, these were, this is why I had to find like, okay, we have to use this version for this, this version mm -hmm. for that. And mm -hmm. um, it seemed like I didn't know what was going on, but it is really because I didn't know which version is in which mm -hmm. application. Um, and uh, it was actually quite nice, uh, uh, some of the bugs that you did experience. I love the way how you try to really falsify mm -hmm. the verification. Um, and I'm happy that we, uh, we, we withstood that. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really great. And I, I can say, you know, um, feeling of where we are right now, I'm super excited. Um, I know that we are about to go into the hacktrophy uh, part of it and to get the real professional hackers with mm -hmm. real creative approaches to have a look at the software itself. And I can't wait to see what they come up with, if there is any big flaw and whether we whether we as a team were able to see far enough or think far ahead enough mm -hmm. um, of preventing such things of taking place. So this is going to be a very interesting time for us. Um, and uh, hopefully we won't find very big issues and we can go live with the application and start with the process of people starting to experience just the first application. It's um, How did you find the interview? I found some of the questions were quite hard, <laughs> but what I liked about it is that it was topics which meant something. Um, it wasn't just like, you know, it, it wasn't like a, a general random interview just about the technology. It was more about what is the vision, what is behind it, why, how, and, you know, asking market related questions, which also result in what giving me a chance to express and explain how we see it mm -hmm. and and to to relate to the market itself I, I think it will answer a lot of questions for a lot of people um, and that's what I really appreciated about the interview um, you know being put on uh, on a spot but in a different manner where where uh, as, as we spoke you know it, it is it becomes more natural that I get to think and uh, that I get to answer something that is non-related to the technology itself, but rather to the environment. And not prepared. Yeah, and not well. prepared, yeah. How do you feel the other guys did in the interviews? Uh, well, <laughs> I think they all did much better than me. <laughs> <laughs> so you are completely confident in the team being able to explain, as the CEO, I mean, that's one of the things that sometimes you, you can clearly see in some big companies, that the CEO has the vision and it's their vision and they need to control it and anyone else talking about it almost has to go through PR and legal before it can go out there. Like, I didn't sense any resistance no. to, like uh, Mate is the CMO that you, get, you love uh, seen on the interview. Like he didn't know he was gonna be interviewed until five minutes before. Mm -hmm. Like he wasn't prepared for it. There was no resistance to yeah. it. That you talk about that transparency, the openness. There's, I've not managed to find, I mean, I've even seen your storage rooms downstairs. <laughs> like I'm yet to find any sort of closed doors that have clearly been held back. Um, so, you say you feel like they can explain the vision? I've, I think for sure everyone on the team, um, you know, we have a, my door is always open, Rastislav's door is always open. It's only when we have like a closed meeting or an interview where we do need quiet that it's closed. But everyone discusses everything in every aspect of the company itself because everything's interlinked. Everybody knows everything. And at any given moment, if you ask anyone in any team member, uh, in our company, they'll be able to give you an answer. They might not always know every single answer out of technical perspective or something like this, mm -hmm. or out of a marketing perspective, but out of the vision, out of the goal, and out of the philosophy of the company, everyone would be able to immediately answer you. And we don't believe in, um, you know, a, we believe in a flat structure, that everyone has access to everything. Um, if, 
any of the developers, they don't need to go through a manager or the team lead or anything. If they want to ask me a question, they write me directly. If they want to ask Rastislav a question, Michael a question. We all are accessible for everyone at any given moment because it's the best way to bring a vision like this to market. Otherwise, if you have to have these corporate structures in place and legal and saying, oh, you cannot say that, you cannot do that, in a transparent environment, there is no hierarchy. There is a flat structure and that's it. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, it's been a an immense pleasure coming to meet you guys and hopefully I'll come back again and see you guys in, in the future. Um, but yeah, just for allowing me to be here and experience all this, I just wanna say thank you again. And yeah, I wish this project all the best because everything that I've seen so far could really, we were talking about before, it genuinely could change the world. Mm -hmm. And that's a saying that's probably used far too much in the tech industry. But for anyone who's watching that hasn't gone through, I haven't, I'm, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to edit this whole thing together yet. That's the thing. I've just been capturing footage <laughs> and capturing the experience. Um, so maybe there's enough in this video and you can be like, yeah, yeah, keep it shut up. Like you've just shown us exactly how this works. But if not, there's the video we did with Crypto Slate where we went into really uh, deep detail. You did a video on this couch going through core pass and how that works. So check those out. Um, and yeah, just thank you very much for having me. I right, thank you. Thank you very much for also coming to see it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Bye. Ciao.